Welcome to our journey into CSS selectors. Now, you already know CSS, and if you don't, please pause and move right into our absolute CSS. We assume you know CSS, but we're going to take a deep look into selectors. We're going to skip a few selectors that are just so core fun fundamental, such as the class, such as the ID, and such as the element selector. But we're going to start off in this lecture look, taking a look at the joker selector, as I like calling it, or as the official documentations call them, the universal selector. The universal selector enables you to select basically everything by just putting there a star. Let's jump right into it. It's the first selector that we see, the most simple one introduced in CSS 2.0. So let's get started. CSS selectors, and that is our main topic for this chapter. Let's jump right into it, starting with the core selectors, the, the most simple selectors out there. So I'm going to go into our source files and right into our styles. And I want to talk about them just going through ones that you already know, which, for example, the body or going directly to elements, which is something you know previously or you've been uh, lately familiarized with in our absolute CSS training. Now, those type of selectors are literally just defining the tag, whatever the tag is, and then placing whatever values we want to put into it. The next type is classes, and we could see here a class, and we could see here a class. So, for example, for the article class, we set here a background color, and if we look at our element, we'll see this is our article, and we have here a background color. So, I'm going to go ahead here and mark this because this is also something relatively old. It's from CSS1, completely available to any browser that supports CSS. Last but not least is the ID tag, which enabled us, again, from CSS1, to control elements based on their IDs. So that's really the quick overview. I'm really not going to go deep into it. If you don't know what I'm talking about, then please stop because this course is not for you. Jump right into our absolute CSS where you'll learn a lot more about the rules of CSS. But that is just a really, really quick overview. That's where we're going to start this chapter, and I want to just talk about one more element that is a CSS2 element, which is quite exciting, which we have not explored yet. Now, the CSS attribute is, is basically called the star. Well, it's called, a, it, well, it, it is a star. It's not called a star, but it basically enables you to basically um, define everything. It's kind of like a joker, and this joker is, it, it, literally, I could just say, hey, anything that doesn't have a background, um, so I'm going to go ahead and set here a background to it. So I'm just going to set a background about, we'll just set a background color, or I could just go ahead and set it to be a background. And, and let me set here a color. I'm going to go ahead here and just select some sort of a color here. So let me just go to my browser. I'll select the color using um, uh, this plugin, which is called Colorzilla. Make sure you install it because it's really helpful. And I'm going to go ahead here and select one of these colors right here. So that's going to co the color I'm going to use as a default background to all elements. And literally what we'll do is anything that does not have a background configured, it's going to slap a nice beautiful background onto it. So if I go ahead and click on refresh, we'll see that now all the elements that didn't have a background will now have a background. Every single paragraph, every single headline, every single element that did not have a background previously. Obviously that's a little bit mad, so I'm going to go ahead here and just comment that out because we don't really want that. But I'm going to go ahead also and make sure that you have that marked Oops, you have that mark that that is a CSS2 attribute. And our first CSS2 uh, selector that we've met, we're going to meet a lot more of those throughout this course. Now, before I wrap up this lecture, which I'm almost done with it, you might think, why would you ever need to select everything? Technically, you probably would never need to select every single everything, but it could be very useful if you want to say, for example, um, let's see, we want to travel into the article. So I'm going to go ahead here and create here a dot article. And I want to say that anything that is inside of the article, I want to do to it something. Or even better, I might say, hey, everything that's inside of the article that also has a span tag. So I'm going to go ahead here and set your span. And I'm going to set here another span. And let me, set, let me just set here a couple of spans. Okay, so I set a couple of spans, and we see here we have one here and two inside of this paragraph. And and what I could say is, hey, by the way, anything that is inside of here, any anything inside of the article that contains a span, let's do stuff to those spans. And then I could go ahead and say, okay, I want to have a background, and I want to set this background to be yellow, and I also want to have a color. 
uh, for my font and I'll make sure that it's, uh, let's say we'll make sure that it's red. And if I go ahead and save this, now every single span that is inside of the R paragraphs will be highlighted. Beautiful. So that is the simplicity and power of basically using the CSS2 attributes, which is our joker. Um, that's it. We're done with our first lecture in this chapter. And then we'll continue in the next lecture exploring more CSS selectors. Zero to geek. Learning better is better. We're still deep into the world of CSS selectors. In the last lecture, we met the joker selector or the universal selector. In this lecture, we're going to take a deeper look into link selectors and we group together a few selectors, some from CSS1 and CSS2, but with it, by the end of this lecture, you will know all the CSS selectors that relate to links. So let's jump right into them and let's meet them. Inside of our selectors chapter, you're going to find a link right in one of the paragraphs and below you'll find also a few text boxes. The point of this lecture is really to talk about the link pseudo classes, which have been available since CSS1. I'm just going to go ahead here and put here a title so you could refer back to it whenever you want to. And the next ones are going to be user action pseudo classes. Now, the idea behind the word pseudo is basically because there is no class there. It's like a fake class. It's like a kind of class, right? So instead of having a, a, a pseudo class, basically enables me to create a rule for links. So for example, if I wanted to go to all A links and I want to just set them for their link to be in a different color. Let me just go ahead there and I'm going to set a different color to our A link and I'm going to set its color. How about we set the color to be white? All right, so we just set an A link. It is color is going to be white. If the user never visited in that specific item, then it will be white. Another element of the links is enables us to create a visited attribute. Visited. And in that case, I'm going to set my color to be red. And I'll go ahead and save it. And if I go back into my application and click on refresh, we'll see that now our link is white. If I click into it, the color, as you notice, changed to be red. If I come back here, you'll see that my color is red. Now, this doesn't always work perfectly in modern browsers, uh, especially Firefox, even though we're running currently on Firefox. And that is because the specification has changed. And part of that specification comes to security, because there are ways for users to basically grab the color that's on the screen of elements on the page, which, me which means that they might be able to know your traveling path. And that could be very dangerous, because then developers will be able to know if you visited a certain page or not, even if you disabled tracking. So one of the stuff is that some some versions of Firefox just don't have it at all. It is still part of the specification. But in that specification, there is a definition, a newer definition that marks that security risk and saying, uh, make sure that developers won't be able to read that information. Uh, some browsers just decided just we're just not going to uh, enable you to control the color of the visited links. That's going to stay in the hands of the browser. So if you, in your specific browser you see right now that the link does not work, that you don't see the visit, that's because part of the specification enables the browser to decide if they're going to actually adhere to that visited or not. So I want to talk, talk further, Oto, about another thing. Since CSS2 and onwards, we don't really have to define what we're actually specifying. So I could just say visited. And that, by default, our browser will know that we're referring to a link and we're referring to a, uh, a visited link. And that is because in the new world, there is those stars. So by default, when we don't put anything, we're basically, say, we're basically saying everything in that case. So if I go ahead and click on save, you'll see that in this scenario, our link will still be red, even though we didn't define it as every A tag. Um, so I'm just going to leave your one with the A tag. So you'll have a reference to the old way of doing it in CSS one and without anything, which is the way you could do it in CSS two and onwards, because you just, it's just redundant. We're basically saying any link will have that specification. All right, so let's move on to the CSS two specific, although there's some that has been available also in CSS one. And I want to talk about the active. So I'm going to start off by setting a specific, I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, I want to auto link to our A when it's active. Now, the difference here is that even though I'm talking to a link, this is not a link pseudo code. It's a user action one because active means is that it's currently being engaged. And in this case, let's say I want to set the color to be black. So as it's getting set, as it's getting clicked, I want the, 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 
action itself to show me that click. So you can see that as I'm clicking on it, the color is changed. Okay. So let's continue. So those, the, that was the active. There's two more that I want to cover in this lecture. And for that, I'm going to move on to our inputs. And I want to say to all my inputs, every input that exists, I want to set a hover, something hovering over it. So whenever the user is hovered over, I want to do something. For example, when the user hovers on, how about we set that the color and while the user is hovered, but the item is not focused, we're going to set a color to the, let's do it to the border color. Let's set a border color and to the border. Let's say I'm going to set a border color of red. I'm going to go ahead and just continue immediately. So we don't waste too much time. Toes are talking about the focus and the difference between focus and hover. So focus is when the item itself is actually selected already. There is no action already. It's already in there. In this case, let's set a border color as well. And I'm going to set a border color. Let's make it black just for the sake of simplicity. So if I go ahead here and click on refresh and I'll scroll down to those text boxes, notice that now when I roll over a text box, I have a red shadow around it, a red a red border around the item. And once I click into it, the border turns black. And there we go. That's it. That is all of the actions and all of the, all of the actions and all of the link related actions that we could do in CSS one, two, and three for that matter. So we'll see you in the next lecture where we continue exploring different selector rules that we could do in CSS in the world of CSS three. In the last few lectures, we were slowly progressing into the world of CSS selectors. We've met quite a few CSS1 selectors and CSS2 selectors. And this lecture is still in the CSS2 world, but it's edging us into the world of CSS3. We're going to start off looking at attributes, and it's going to be the first lecture in that topic. And the next lecture will still be about attributes, but in CSS3. So attribute selectors really cut down the complexity of code because they enable us to basically select elements based on their attributes as well. We're going to see a few of those, basically all the ones that were introduced in CSS2 and then move on in the next lecture to take a look at what was evolved and what was added in in CSS3. So let's jump right into CSS attribute selectors. Let's continue our journey into CSS selectors. And now we're ready to move on to a new type of selector, which is an attribute selector, which has been available since CSS2, but, spit, but has been expanded in CSS3. It is widely available on most modern browsers, but make sure to check our references where you'll find a link with availability based on browsers and the selector versions. But we're going to start with the 2.0 and to make this happen, I'm going to go into my HTML and just grab one of our paragraphs. I'm going to go ahead and just grab this paragraph and I'm going to go ahead and add a new data attribute. In HTML5, you could literally add any attribute if you start with the word data dash and then give it a name. In this case, I'm going to call it data type. I'm just going to create a variable. It doesn't really do anything. Uh, HTML will ignore it. It's wonderful if you need to add stuff that you want to use in JavaScript. Uh, very, very useful. Right now, in this case, we're going to take advantage of it to use it with CSS. So I'm going to go ahead for this data type and I'm going to configure a data type. For the data type, I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to start it off with calling it accessible. And the idea behind this is that this data type is the for the accessibility features. We're going to make it a lot more legible for users that need that type of technology. And right now we're going to do it all over for our site because we're not using JavaScript and we're not using any advanced uh, splitting or separating of our logic. But I'm going to go ahead and literally create this attribute. So I'm going to go ahead into my style sheet and I'm just going to find a nice empty spot here right after all the last few uh, items that we've created. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to set that attribute. Now I could go ahead and just define it based on its position. In this case, we could go ahead and set it's inside of our article body, I believe. No, it's right out of the article. So it's inside of our body. It's a, uh, it's inside of a, but basically just inside of our body. So I could go ahead and show set your body and P and, and, and configure it on and on. Or I could just go ahead to my paragraph and say, Hey, paragraph, but not every paragraph, only paragraphs that have a data type which basically means this is the attribute that we created. So only paragraphs that have this data type would then be controlled by this uh, a, a rule. 
And in this rule, what I want to do, I want to go ahead and set our foreground color to be, um, let's say, make let's make it black or let's make it white. And I want to make my background color. I want to make that background color to be black, making a very sharp difference. And I could go ahead and just use the background directly. If I go ahead and save this and go into my browser and click on refresh, we'll see that one of our paragraphs now is going to be highlighted, making it a lot easier to read. Now. Let's take a deeper look into this. So this is, by the way, it's called uh, it's called an attribute selector. It's been available since CSS 2.0. So I'm going to go ahead here and just add that rule right here. So what if that this was not good enough? And in this case, it really isn't because here we're just going to any attribute. So let me just go ahead and mark it down or even I'll leave it there. We're going to override it with the next one. And in the next one, I want to say, okay, paragraph that has a data type attribute, but we also want to know its value and its value needs to be accessible. And in this case, again, it's also available in CSS 2.0. And how about in this case, if we're in the accessible, then I'm going to switch it around and I'm going to switch the color around. And this time the color will be uh, color will be black and the background will be white. And in this case, this should override the item above it. So if we go ahead and click on refresh, we should have here uh, override where it's going to be white. And it's only white because we actually defined it based on a name that exists. But if we put here accessible to accessible to does not exist. And for accessible to it would not match that new rule that we had right below there. So there's a an exact matching of our ruling. Let's continue. So beyond that, what would happen? And this is all nice, right? Right. But this we could have done easily with just setting a dot, basically a class attribute. Basically, this would probably do the exact same thing, right? So if I'm just going to comment that out, this would probably do the same thing. So we'd have any paragraph that is dot accessible. Speaking of which, we could have deducted out that P or put there a star, which would, which would be basically the same thing, saying any attribute. All right. But I'm going to leave that with that paragraph for now. Let's go on to the next one. Let's go on to the next attribute uh, rule, rule, which is very similar to this first rule that we created, but really where it stands out the feature of this of this component. Beyond uh, our capability of setting it based on an explicit value like we've done in line 38, we could also define it with white spaces. So in this case, imagine that we had here not only a paragraph that has here an accessibility, what if it was accessible, light, um, large? All right, so maybe it's accessible, light, and large. How do we fetch only the accessible, or how do we know it's accessible? How do we make sure that if it is accessible still at this stage, if I just go ahead here and just delete this just for a second, and I click on refresh, we'll see that it's not going to recognize it anymore because it really, literally really isn't that um, value anymore because our value is not explicitly accessible. It's, it is accessible, but it is kind of accessible, and we use that um, squiggly, which you'll find right next to your number one, uh, when you press on shift if you're typing in english so this value basically enables you to say kind of about basically including white spaces basically break down the content into um, distinct uh, modules that will then have that separation so if i go ahead and i click here refresh we'll see that now it will recognize it not only will it recognize that I could go ahead and also say, hey, by the way, if you're light in this case, if you have a property which is called light, then, you know, switch it around and make it light. Or maybe in this case, um, uh, let's let's make it light. And if this if we say we want it to be light, then we're going to set here the color to be yellow and we're going to set the background to be black or we won't even touch the background. So if we have a light color, it will be light. And we could do the same thing for the large. So if I go ahead here and set here another rule, and that other rule will say any item that says on it large, then go ahead and set how about our font size. We'll change our font size to be three times its normal size or its bounding area normal size. So we're going to duplicate the size of that normal font size. If we go ahead and we click on refresh here, we should see that our font size will grow dramatically, our text will be yellow, and our background will remain black. So if we take a deep look in this, we'll see that because we're accessible, then our color type is black. Because we're, well, actually technically, because we have a data type, 
then our background is black. We're not accessible, so we're skipping this item because it's not explicitly ac accessible, so that rule is not applied. But because we're light, our color will be yellow. And because we're large, our font size is larger. And we're using that with that. I don't even know how to call that. I'm just going to call it the squiggly line. Before we complete our conversation about the CSS2 selectors, there's one more selector left. Now, to take advantage of it, I want to go back into our HTML, and I'm going to go ahead into a new paragraph, and I'm going to give it a new data type as well. And in this data type, what I want to do is I want to basically configure it in a hierarchy. Now, this hierarchy is very similar, or it is actually exactly the same, like the hierarchies you have in CSS, where you have a font, and then you have a dash size. So in this case, I want to set it to be accessible. That's the that's that's basically accessible is the, basically the the family type you could say or the the hub of it all. Now wh what what's uh, beneath it? How about we say that beneath it would be a uh, light large light or light large. So how about we set it to be light large. So it, it, light large or uh, if we could have an accessible light and we could then have a space and say accessible accessible uh, but let's start with X how, how about we'll just make it a hierarchy where we say accessible light and large so it's basically a subcategory so an item for it to be uh, light it must be accessible an item for it to be large it must be accessible and light so that way it's basically a sub configuration of the element what that means for us when we're creating our CSS rules that would apply to this item, if we're adhering it as a class itself, or we're setting it as a data type, it really doesn't matter in this case. If we want to configure the rules and define them to try to basically uh, call them only in specific scenarios, we could easily call this a class as well if we wanted to, and approach that item and just write here class. But what I want to do next is I want to show you that in this case, for example, the large item, it, it might work for the top item, but it's not work, going to work for the item I, bottom item no longer. So I'm going to go ahead and create one more item, and I'm going to position it right underneath here. And I, I really want this item to be larger, but I only want it to be larger if it is accessible. Or in this case, how about let's start with accessibility. So with the case of accessibility, I want to ask if it's accessible, right? But I'm not trying to ask, is it accessible, period. I'm trying to ask, is it accessible in that separated list that is separated by those dashes? Now, to do that, I'm going to start my item with a pipe. So we start without a pipe, is it exactly a match? With the squirrely line or the wiggly line, we saw that it was... What did we see it was? I don't remember. Do you remember? Well, of course I remember. So with the squiggly line, it was based on a space. So if the item itself was in a space separated item, just like we have with classes, then it would find it based on that space separated separation. The last item that we have in CSS 2.0 is this controller that basically is if it's in part of that uh, list that is separated with dashes so i'm going to go ahead here and just click on save for a second click on save in my css as well what i'm expecting is for this new item to be accessible and what does that mean it means that the font size would be crazy large but really in this case i want to make sure that let's say our background would be uh, a dark color i'm going to set it to be gray and i'm going to be uh, set my foreground color to be very light so i'm going to set it to be yellow making it very accessible a yellow and gray very legible so I'm going to go ahead here and click on refresh and we should hope to see that our item is now yellow on gray. In this case, it's kind of a very dark black, but let me just close this so we could see everything here. And I'm just going to go ahead here and also make sure in this case, I'm going to make make sure what what are we approaching i think this is our item oh we did yellow on both so let me set here this one to be uh red and i'm going to set the background to be yellow so it'll be a very clear separation let's go ahead and give it another shot here and you know what let me also make that font size much smaller because I, I i i while i was testing things out i made it way too big so let me go ahead there and make it smaller and here we go so now we have our font that was larger in our black container and right underneath it our yellow uh, our red copy in a black container 
So notice how this accessible this time around is completely different because it's derived out of these um, dashes. Now, if you go ahead and say, hey, I want to set here only items that are light in that dash rule, that is an option, but you must also take into consideration if you're just setting it to be light, and I'll click here on refresh, you'll see that the, this rule will not get applied. Now, the reason why this rule is not getting applied is very simple. It's because it assumes that you're going through that priority. So if it's not accessible light, which would be the value that you would want to put here, it would not find it. Literally, in many ways, this pipe sign is basically, uh, in many, many ways, it's really starting with in many, many ways. Although maybe it's a, just a current interpretation of Firefox, but if I go ahead here and I click on refresh, we'll see that it will work even if it's starting um, in this hyphen separated list of values. All right, so I'm going to go ahead and move on to CSS3, and I'm going to see you in the next lecture, but really you would hope that there would be a, a more plausible way, such as maybe putting here a star and saying anything that is star light. If I go ahead here and click on refresh, uh, that would be wonderful if that would be implemented, if, that were, if there was a way for us to do that currently, but currently I don't have a specific way using this uh, comma delimination to just select this item that is light. I have to incorporate that full path, which could be one of the reasons why it's not going to be as popular and not going to be as used as features such as these separated items um, that would be a lot more useful. So that's it for this lecture, and we're going to see you in the next lecture where we continue with this conversation, but we're going to cross over into CSS attribute selectors. So see you in the next lecture when we do that. In the last lecture, we were introduced to the CSS2 attribute selectors. And this lecture is going to continue talking about selectors, attribute selectors, but we're going to take a deeper look into the new attribute selectors added in to CSS3. By the end of this lecture, you will know all the different CSS selectors for attributes, both CSS2 and 3, incorporated. So let's jump right into it. We're finally ready to talk about some CSS3 selectors. We're talking about attribute CSS3 selectors. For availability and um, browser availability, make sure to check our references where we have a few links to browser availability as well in them. And I'm going to go ahead and right away start. And we're going to start off with there's three new additional attribute um, variables, you could say, that have rules. Selectors, really. That's probably the right word for that, right? So let's go ahead. Let's jump right into it. The first one of those selectors enables us to basically define if an item starts with a certain value. It is very easy to work with, and I'm going to grab the, this uh, or pipe selector that we had earlier. And I'm going to go ahead and instead of setting that pipe, I'm going to go ahead and set here a uh, uh, where are you? Shift six, which is the triangle, that upper triangle. I don't even know how to call it. If you do, well, I'll say it in a comment. One, and then once and for all, I'll know how to name this whenever I call it. All right, I'm going to keep the same rule here. So I'm going to go ahead and just del comment out our CSS selector above here that made our second paragraph yellow. I'm going to go ahead and set it to the starting with, and if I save this, go back into my application and click on refresh, we should be seeing the same result. Only this time around, this rule is basically overriding that basic accessibility because both items start with the words accessible. All right, so this rule is a lot more explicit than the pipe rule, which only found items that were controlled via pipe. But beyond that, one more extra feature of this item that is not available with accessibility one, which was available in CSS2, I want to show it to you in action. So let me just undo this for a second. What if we had our, in our we wanted any item that starts with access? If I just set it to the word access, because there is no direct reference to access here, but it's accessible, you'll see that the value would not work. It would not change the color of our item to be yellow. Contrary to that, well, basically the only way it would is if we set the full path name of whatever is between those dashes. And not only that, it had to start from the beginning of the dashes series. So that was very limiting. In, in many ways, it was extremely limiting. So let's go ahead and comment this rule out. And we're going to go back into our rule in CSS3, because it starts with does not search for complete words, I could go ahead and say, hey, anything that starts with the word access, and it could be accessibility, access mobility, access, whatever it would be, any item that starts with access or even just access as a whole value it would work for us. And in this case, if I went ahead here and clicked on refresh, then we would basically get both items.
Now, I want to take one more look and one more observation at this. And the observation I want to do is this one. You could not only, and that was true to all the other items as well, if we wanted to define this based on a class, if we wanted this to be part of a class, we could have gone ahead and easily set it to be in a class. And all we would have to do is just instead of set it to our data type, go and set it to our class, which would make sense if we're making a rule that would be applied always anytime there is an accessibility class inside of the application. I'm going to go ahead here. If I click on refresh, we'll see that now our second item, which is the only one that has a class, Define would actually have that accessibility rule inside of the item. All right, so that starts with, I'm going to continue with this class rule, and I'm going to go ahead here and just copy the rule, but this time around, I'm going to go ahead and say anything, not only a paragraph, but anything that has a class that not only not starts with, uh, not, not that starts with, but that ends with. So to make it to end with, I'm going to set there with the end, and any class that ends with the word large, then how about we make it really large? And in this case, I'm going to go ahead here, any class that ends with the word large, I'm going to go ahead and set its font size. And I'm going to set it to be three times, three times its normal size. I'm going to go ahead here, relatively speaking, it's going to be a lot larger. <clears throat> Beautiful. So that worked brilliantly. That enables us basically controlling based on the ending. And I didn't have to use a full word. I could have used just the last three characters if I wanted to. And it would basically check to the last element. So if I wanted to, I could start with, with the beginning with, ending with, and last but not least, and the most complex one from a perspective of complexity of searching would be a class and I'm deliberately doing it a little bit different each time. Notice how in the first time it was a paragraph, second time was any item and now I'm just not putting anything, which really from CSS2 and onwards means anything. So I don't have to put that star in, in, in a case like this, it's, it would find any class. And in this case, I wanna have any class that has any value. And what value, uh, any class that has the value of light within it. All right, so if it has the light value light within it, if there's a space, if there's no space, it doesn't really matter. If the word light is inside, then I want to set, how about what we're going to do? We are going to set our color uh, of our background to be white. And only if we have light inside, there we go, we have light. So if I click here on refresh, we should see now that our yellow text box should hopefully uh, switch a color, but in this case, let's see what's going on here. So in this case, we're searching for contains a value. And I'm going to go ahead, just for the sake of our uh, testing, I'm going to go ahead and put here just a value from within any kind of mismatch, mix match of values. And I'm going to go ahead also and just make sure that it's a paragraph because it might be just not working without putting, without setting anything. So I might just have to set something instead of nothing. So I'm going to go ahead here and just set you're a paragraph. Click on refresh. Let's give it a try. And here we go. Here we go. So that's exactly what my problem was, is was I set the value to be without absolutely anything. And actually, that is not could probably legal. So it did not work. But I could put here a star, which is probably what I have to do. But I do believe that in the future, putting nothing would be equivalent to putting a star. But let's not live in the future, let's live in the now, where we have to define something, and if we don't want to define something, we could just put there a beautiful star that would act as if anything could be there. So basically, uh, one extra character, not too bad. Not too bad indeed. And that finishes our conversation about CSS attribute selectors in general. And obviously we're done speaking about CSS3 selectors as well. I'll see you in the next lecture where we continue talking about selectors. We're not done with selectors, but we're done with the attribute selectors. In the last few lectures, we were talking about CSS attribute selectors. We're gonna go back to CSS2 now, and we're gonna visit the lang attribute. Well, that lang selector. It's a pseudo selector. It's a, anything that starts with a round bracket, which is going to be the first one that we see that looks like a function if you know JavaScript, basically is a more advanced feature that is not going to support a lot of other things that we're going to see. You can't nest advanced features one inside of each other. So you cannot nest an inside of uh, anything that we're going to see later on, the selector that we're going to see currently. Now, what does it do? The language enables us to create basically customizations based on a language in our CSS. Now in general, Google suggests and most search engines suggest that you separate your HTML pages per language. So don't serve up the same HTML page that will serve up to your customers or users that speak completely different languages. With that said, 
My personal suggestion to you is if you have a brand and you don't have the capability of maintaining completely separate entities for, for example, your French users versus your Canadian French users, but you do want to add a little bit layer of customization such as in headlines where you just want to give those users a little bit of a level of personalization to those communities, the language attribute could become very, very useful. And we're going to take a look at that in this lecture. By the end of this lecture, you're going to know everything you need to know about the language attributes and selectors and what can you do with them and what can't you do with them. So let's jump right into it and see it in action. All right, so we're taking a break from a lot of CSS rules and we're going to focus on one. It's a little bit of a practice. It's a CSS2 selector, which enables us to control languages. While we were away, I've added three new headlines, one with bicycle in American English, a second with bicyclette, bicyclette, I believe, which is in Canadian French, and vélo in French French, which all mean bicycle. But really, if you're creating a website and imagine that it's in French, or even in that case, if you're in American English or British English, but you don't want to create a brand completely new page for the content, imagine that there's a headlight that's talking about underwear. Well, in the United States, it would be called underwear, but in the UK and a lot of other regions in the world, it would be called pants. So you, if you want to create the same page and there's just some small changes that you want to create to the page, there are ways for you to define those small little differences you, you probably wouldn't put a lot of different languages in one page from a level of you don't want to load up the page with too much information, but if it's small things such as headlines where you want to create a little bit of customization based on where the user is, the lang attribute it becomes incredibly powerful. Now, I want to show you the lang attribute in general in HTML, and you'll notice in all of our documents in our defining element in our HTML, we defined it to be in English. I'm going to go ahead and change that to fr because our document is actually going to be based off of French, even though that it is very much in English. Now, if you scroll down and find our headlines that we've just added in, you'll notice that I've added a language attribute to each of them. One is French Canadian. Another is French French. Um, and what I want to do next is I want to basically define a specific styling rule and to be able to control and gain access to specific elements. So for example, if I go ahead and say, in this all, all of this document that speaks French, I want to build a new rule. And this new rule that I want to build is very explicitly to everything that is French, assuming we're on the French page, because the CSS could be used both for the French language and many other languages as well. In this case, let's do something relatively theoretical. Maybe we know that people that speak French really love it when their backgrounds are red. In that case, we would go ahead, and I'm just going to go ahead here and just create here another CSS2 two um, rules for language. So let me just find your a spot for that. And I'm just going to paste it right here. And this we're talking about CSS2 language selectors. Now, the rule is incredibly easy. I first define what property do I want. In this case, really, I want everything. So I'm going to st start it with a star there. And I'm going to set the language by setting the property lang opening up a round bracket, and then defining the language itself. In this case, I want everything that is French to be highlighted. Let's say I want its background to be red. Now, in this case, once I define the French, anything that is French for its background to be red, let's see what would happen. I'm going to click here at refresh and notice how everything now turned French because everything in our document is French. That's not really true, right? So let's go ahead here and revert back our full document to be in English. And notice where um, the red color will be defined this time around. This time around, only the French-related languages, such as bicycle, which was in Canadian French, notice that dif differentiator, where it was fr-ca for Canadian French, or fr-fr for French French. Now, Parisian French, more accurately, or European style French. In this case, if I only wanted for French that is Canadian to be red, then maybe I would highlight that Canadian French to be in red. A more realistic scenario is you might want to basically assume that if the ad, usually you would do this in JavaScript, or if, for example, anything that is Canadian French, let, let's hide. So I would go ahead there, and instead of setting it to be red, I would say display none. And I basically get rid of that item because I know that I'm only 
interested in showing the French French language item. So anything that has a language separator that is not that specific language, then would that then be automatically removed. Now, obviously, something like that I would probably do with the help of JavaScript. And in that case, or or in that case, I would add a, an extra logic into the HTML page itself and inject just those extra words that would just get rid of a specific language that is not being uh, controlled right now. JavaScript would probably be a really good scenario for this because if someone does not support JavaScript, they'll just see both headlines. But if someone does support JavaScript, then we'll go ahead and remove the content that is not relevant to them in that specific time. So that we're not going to cover that because that is a separate title with which is working in JavaScript. But before we wrap up this conversation about languages, I want to talk about one more thing. There, there's we've met already before earlier. We've met the possibility of creating different CSS access rules, and one of those access rules that we've met not long ago was the pipe. And we said the pipe basically enables us to select an item, select an item that starts with a specific value that is dash separated. Remember. So if I didn't want to do French, for example, here, and I'm just going to go ahead here and just comment this out here for a second. And if instead I went ahead and said, hey, by the way, anything that starts with anything, right, that has a property which is called lang, that its value is starting with the value of fr, then we want to do something to it. So for example, we want to set that value to be display none. Or in this case, really, let's let's set it exactly to be the same type of sample with FRCA. It works very similarly, but the difference is quite big. Now, you're not going to recognize the, di the difference immediately. If we go ahead and we click on refresh, we'll notice that we're still getting rid of that Canadian French. But the only big difference between the two is this. If I went ahead here and I set to be, for example, I set our whole document to be inside of that specific uh, language. So I'm going to go ahead here to my language and I'm going to set that language to be FRCA, Canadian French. Our whole document is Canadian French. Now again, instead of uh, making it invisible, let me just use that red color because we don't want our whole document to disappear. So let me just uh, delete that. I'm going to go ahead here, set that background to be red. And if I click on refresh, notice what happens. Notice that even though I've selected supposedly everything and everything here in this document is now French because I defined the whole document to be red, right? Oh, excuse me. The whole document to be Canadian French. So I would assume that everything here would be Canadian French, but not true. Because I was using a property directly, so it's true. The whole body, the whole page is red. That uh, paragraph is red. The whole thing is red, but everything else is not. And that is the big difference or the small difference really between the language attribute when you're defining it directly with the language itself versus not using the language and instead of that using an attribute. So in this case, when we had this uh, starting with FR, then everything that would be in French would start, but it would still not solve our problem or our desire if we said that the whole document is French and we set, we set the whole document to be French, this would not work. This would only work in a scenario where we only want specific items that are defined in that um, rule. But really, many times what we would really want is, for example, if we have this FR, but inside there are sub um, divs, sub whatever's inside there, they would not be affected. Only the parent itself would be affected. So if we want all to be affected, when we're using the language by default, it will automatically affect all of the items. So that's really the big difference between the FR, the the language itself using the language versus using the property definers that we've met earlier. So here we go. If we set it, we'll see that all of the page will be affected. And I'm just going to set here because we set it to be display none. So that made the whole document invisible, which is obviously not what we want. So I'm going to go ahead there back into our HTML document and make sure that we're actually defining it to be um, English as a default. And there we go. That's it. That's the core of working with language in general. We're not done with that topic completely, although we've seen how to work with it now inside of the laws that govern CSS2. But now that we're living in the CSS3 world, is there a better, more dynamic way where we could automatically get rid of all the languages that are not that specific language? So I put that on you as a homework assignment. 
You could use JavaScript or you could use CSS. Try to figure out a way before you watch the next few lectures. Try to find a way how could you get rid of all the irrelevant languages, all the languages that are not the default language that we want. I'm fine with you having the default language that you want up above here. What we want is everything. If we let's say I set it to be French French, this is the language I want this application to be in. This page should be rendered in French French, which what this means basically is whenever I serve the French French people or the Canadian French, all I have to do is change this HTML tab. All the rest is completely the same. If I change this one thing or I do it with JavaScript, then all that's all I have to change. And in that case, we want to get rid of all the stuff that are not. So anything that is Lang English would get this would disappear. Anything that's Lang CA would disappear. And that's your goal. Try to find out is there a way for you to do this in a dynamic way? How about starting without a dynamic way? But if you know a little bit of JavaScript, go for it. If you don't know JavaScript, try to search up the selectors. Look into our referrals in the end of the chapter. Try to figure it out before you watch the lecture because that's one of the things that we're going to encounter very soon. So see you in the next lecture where we continue exploring rules of CSS and I hope you will take that break and take up on that challenge. Stop being negative. If I tell you that there's no person behind me, then there's no person behind me. Although I am lying. There is a person I'm just hiding in. Now, when it comes to the CSS rules, um, there's CSS rules that are all positive and uplifting, but there's some that are not. There's the not, which is an advanced one, just like the language one that we met previously. The not attribute or the not selector enables us to basically reverse the request that we're making. In this lecture, you're going to learn how to use the not, which is a CSS3 attribute, a, a, a selector, I don't know why I say attribute all the time, and a very, very powerful one, enabling you to basically negate your request, saying, basically, I want everything but that. Let's see it in action. I hope you did your homework assignment, and I hope you put it in the comment section, because I would love to comment on what you're creating. There's a lot of ways to do what we talked about in the last lecture. Now, I want to basically walk through and teach you a new property, and by the end of this lesson, we're going to see one way of doing just exactly what that sample that we did earlier. So I want to really start off from there, and if you haven't done it yet, I strongly encourage you to stop this video, give it a try, think about it. We've learned everything you really need to, to be able to solve it, even if it's complicated. But you could definitely search up online to try to find other related issues items. We're going to be learning about negation pseudocodes in a second, but even before we do that, I want to take advantage of this, uh, all the th stuff we've learned so far. So I'm going to go ahead and save our application, just take a quick uh, refresh, quick view here. We'll see that all our three language elements are still in play. What I'm going to do is basically something very simple. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and say every, th every item, every single item that has a language code, I'm going to go ahead and make it invisible. Now, notice that this is going to not work the way we want it. The main reason it's not going to work is because our whole document has a language reference as well. In this case, it's French French. So if I go ahead and I click on refresh here, we're going to note that we're going to have here in a, a completely blank page, which is not our intention. Our intention Chin is only things that are content of the body. So in our body, anything in our body that has a language attribute. So anything with a language attribute, automatically let's get rid of it. And in this case, we got rid of those three attributes or those three H2s. Perfect. All that's left for us to do is to go ahead and add one more rule after we got rid of all of them and say, hey, by the way, if you're FR, FR, then please come back. Let's, uh, let's set it to be inherit. Or you could set it to be block in our case because we know all these items are block elements. So I'm going to go ahead here, save this, click on refresh, and this time around we'll see that now only the French item is going to come back. And this is exactly how you would do this dynamically. And if we had the leveraging of JavaScript, we probably would do both of these steps dynamically in JavaScript where we would get rid of the all the items in the language and then return the language. That is in the world of CSS2 without using any CSS3. Now I'm going to go ahead and, and, and add this into our comment block because let's talk about negation because it's going to open up the door to another variant, another way for us to do this. So the, the negation code is very, very intuitive and maybe not intuitive. That, that was a little bit of a stretch, but it is very, very cool. 
The idea is exactly the opposite of what you selected. Now we start off with selecting something. So for example, I'm going to go ahead and select all paragraphs in our document. Once I selected all paragraphs, it now in a, in, what if I wanted to select every single item that does not have a class? If I wanted to select every item with a class, what would I do? I literally would just go ahead and ask, do you have a class? And every item with a class, then I could then go ahead and do a rule. But what if I wanted exactly the opposite? What if I wanted every item that does not have a class? Now to do that, I would just mark not, open up a round bracket, and close a round bracket. Inside here, put a rule. Now I could only put simple selectors, which means no open and closing brackets. So for that matter, you're not allowed to have another not inside of a not. There's no nesting. Not only that there's no nesting, you can't call explicitly a lang item. You cannot call anything that is really with a, those round brackets because that's not a simple um, pseudocode. But we do have access to the brackets. We do have access to properties. And in this case, I could say, hey, by the way, everything that is not a class. In other words, all paragraphs that don't have a class, let's do something with them. How about let, let's add padding. So I'm going to go ahead and add 100 pixels of padding to every single paragraph that does not have a class associated with it. And if we go ahead here, save this item, click on refresh, we'll see now all items that do not have a class defined to them will now have extra padding around them. Beautiful. So we're going to keep it the way it is, but let's go back into our language. Now that we have a negation, let's see if we could create a rule that is a lot more comp complex that would, would enable us in one CSS rule to only get rid of the languages that are not the language that we have for our user. And by the way, this could be that extra CSS script that you load only per sp for those customizations, which you could do dynamically as the browser finished loading. Then you load up the specificalities of that specific user, creating really small CSS files that are just appendants to the regular CSS. So let's take a let's take a gander at it. So first of all, I'm going to go into my body and any item in our body again because we don't want to affect every lang, but only languages that are literally inside of our body. Next, we're going to go ahead and say, hey, let's select everything that has a lang attribute. After we have everything with a lang attribute, let's take from all those stuff everything that is not a specific language. In this case, everything that is not our current language, which is fr 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 then we want to get rid of so let's walk through this again we're first getting all of the items that have a lang property once we we got all items that have a lang attribute then we're going ahead and saying we don't want from that list we don't want anything that has the value of fr fr and all all items that are not that will go ahead and set their display to be none now i, I want to point out one of the nice things about this we also avoid the scenario where we need to figure out what was the display type previously and beyond that we're also making sure that well beyond that there's one more note that i want to say before we wrap this up and let's see if that it's working first before i talk about that last tip you'll see that now only the french french item will be visible so literally all we have to do in a real world scenario is to be basically load up an external file that would just add that extra level of customization to our french speaking different french native so if the uh, french friends would get this file and another would another unless we want to do it in JavaScript. So if we wouldn't do it in JavaScript, we'll just load this up in the HTML as one more file. That way we don't have to change our core styling. Now, I, I want to talk about just one more thing. In general, Google does not recommend you using more than one language in a document. That's not necessarily true for small little customizations, such as the differences between British English and American English, or the difference between French English and Canadian English. Because really, if you just have small changes, mainly in headlines and things of those nature, you could very easily, using the lang attribute or using this advanced not capabilities, create a really smart, in a, in a really smart way, get rid of all the stuff that you don't want your user to, to consume in that HTML page. So that's it. We're done talking about languages. We're far away from talking about CSS. And we're done talking about negation, which is a CSS3 only uh, property. And we're ready to move on to more CSS. So we're still at selectors and we're, this chapter is still rolling. So we'll see you in the next uh, lecture where we continue exploring selectors. In the last lecture, we've met the negative. 
and we got that out of the system, so we're not going to be negative again. Now we're going to talk about combinator CSS rules, uh, basically CSS selectors that enable you to basically combine relationships. Basically, well, basically this is a CSS3 thing, very cool, enabling you to basically ask for an item based on a relationship it has with items near it, such as its sibling, such as its parent. Let's see it immediately. Contrary to regular CSS where it's not a direct parent, what if you want to ask, ask for something that is directly the child of a certain element? Let's see it in action. We're going to meet three of those different type of combinators or com combinators. Combinators. Let's do it. Let's continue our journey in the world of CSS selectors. While you were away, I added also a boldness to our um, item here, really to showcase one of the combiners or combinators that we're going to be working on right now. So we're going to cover three new combinators, selectors and that belong to CSS2 and CSS3. So let's get right to them. I'm going to go ahead and just go into my editor. And just before we start, I just want to show you what I'm trying to do. Notice how I set here the B tag around my span outside of it. The reason is, is because I want to show you one of the properties. And even before I do that, I want to make sure that we de-highlight our elements. So I'm going to go right away here and just unmark our uh, background selection. And then I'm going to go right to the end of our new code that we were adding in. And I'm just going to paste it right back in there. So let me just find the end here. And I'm going to go ahead and just paste the code. And we're going to start working on CSS combinator codes of children. So notice this code. I just put it in. It's a little bit different. Notice how instead of having here a star, that we had here before that enable us to select any item inside of an article and inside of it, it has a span instead of them saying any paragraph, I could have also left it at star that has a child. This is the child controller of span. Now what this does is a little bit different than if we just said here, just a star instead of the paragraph or remove that altogether. This means explicitly that the span belongs to the paragraph. Now, if we look in the samples that we have above here, we'll see that this span does not belong directly to the paragraph anymore because it's wrapped around a B tag. So if I go ahead and I click on refresh after I save the files, you'll notice that now this item is not getting highlighted. Now, this becomes really useful in scenarios where you want to be very explicit about if something belongs exactly as a child of an element and not a descendant or a later descendant, such as different spans that do different things depending on what layer of uh, depth they're in. So let's move on and continue to the next item. And the next item is adjacency. And the adjacency enables us to basically know when an item is right near another. And the way we do that, we first start with the item we want our item to be next to. So for example, our H2 is our headline. And I really want every paragraph that is right next to an H2 to have an extra padding around it, mainly in its margin top. And I could go ahead there and just set a really big margin top, making sure just so it's very obvious the example here. And if I go ahead and save this, go back into my application, notice in that plus, this basically said any P that is right after an H2. If I go ahead and I click on refresh here and notice first all these H2s that are right next to a paragraph. We have one here, we have another one here, another one right there. Let's click on refresh. And notice how now we have this extra nice big spacing between our H2 and our paragraph. All right. Now, the, the most important thing to note here, notice how the following paragraphs don't have that extra spacing. And there's a reason behind it. There is an attribute that enables you to do that. And that is from the world of CSS3 combinators. And with the world of CSS3 combinators, then I would have basically the, 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 the option, the possibility of making sure that every single paragraph after an H2, or after a certain element, really not necessarily only H2, that are right after, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this, and I'm going to comment it out, because I want to make sure that we um, don't have any competing things going on at the same time for this example. And I'm going to go ahead here, instead of putting a plus here, I'm going to go ahead and put that squiggly line that is from our shift and the value that is right next to the one. What that will do is basically every element, every paragraph that is underneath an H2. So here's one of them. And it doesn't have to be immediately. So for example, inside of the div class, 
every H, if there's an H2, then everything underneath it that has a paragraph will be in that rule. Same applies for this item. There's an H2, so everything underneath it in the same parent, in the same uh, cluster of items, then it would wrap it around inside of it. Now, just notice that if I put, for example, this H2 inside of a div for uh, any reason, so I'm going to go ahead here and put it inside of a div. Notice how this last div, this last head h2 that is with that h, uh, div will not apply to the paragraphs below them. But because there is already there is already an h2 going on above here, it would be applied. So let me make sure, let me just quickly create here a separation that will make sure that we could sample an example of an item that is not explicitly. So I'm going to go ahead here and for this last paragraph, I'm going to set it to be a div inside of a div. And I'm just going to make sure that that item is completely separate just for the sake of this presentation and example. And then this, oops, and then this item, oops, and then this item will not be part of that chain because it's outside of that boundaries. So I'm going to go ahead here and save this item, click on refresh, and let's see it in action. And you'll see every single paragraph that is one after each other. So with every single item, I don't think I saved it actually. Let me go ahead here and just save this item as well and go ahead there and click on refresh because I would expect to have a, a break in here, I believe. So let me just click on this item to inspect it to see, is it getting that rule? And it surely it does not. And if I go ahead here and inspect this item, uh, it sure does. So in this case, this item is inside of that cluster. And let's see why you see, because here there's a div, so it's not adhering to that item. So that makes sense. But let's find here. So here we have a paragraph and another paragraph. But if I go ahead here and just because I don't have here enough paragraphs, if I go ahead here and I just undo all these HTML changes that I created here, just putting all those paragraphs in the same context, in the same area as the item in that H2, you'll note that all these paragraphs that follow that H2, even if they're further away, and there could be things in between them, will still have that extra indentation, will still have that extra spacing. So in this case, you'll see that now this item is in that rule because it's not sitting in a child container. So that's it. That covers our combatinator CSS styles. In this lecture, we've met two com combatinators or combatinators. Uh, we've met two in CSS2, the one which was the immediate child. The next was a brethren, an adjacent item, while the last one was basically all the things that are right on all the things that are underneath a specific uh, element. So if there's any time that you put a H2 and you want all paragraphs underneath it to be in a different size, then you could control the sizes of them once we pass that paragraph. This could be incredibly useful in scenarios where you have your main copy. And once there's another headline or there's something that happens, all the content below that area would then be resized to a smaller size. So then you could have a lot more a lot more detailed control without needing to use a lot of classes. Very cool features. So we're not done. There's still a lot more selectors to go through. So we're going to see you in the next lecture where we continue to select HTML. Our next group of selectors is UI selectors, as I named them, which are basically selectors that enable us to control the way UI elements look like. Let's jump right into them. It's going to be a lot of fun. This lecture is exclusively CSS3, and our focus is going to be uh, input elements, mainly ones that are clickable, such as a radio box or a checkbox, but not only. Any element that could actually be clicked, it could be a button as well. Our focus will be on a radio button, but what we're going to learn now, which is applicable to the world of CSS3 selectors, is going to be applicable to every clickable element in HTML. All right, to every clickable UI element, more accurately. So let's get started. To get us started, I'm going to go into my HTML right in the beginning of my body, and I'm going to go ahead and what I want to do is I want to create a few input boxes. So I'm going to go ahead and create an input. I'm going to select the type to be a radio box and I'm going to set it to be to have a name which will be language and I'll set an ID to it of English. Now the reason why I'm setting an ID on top of it is because I want to refer to this item directly. And I'm going to set also a value to this element and the value will be English. Now when I'm saying that I want to refer to the item directly is really a question of accessibility. If I wanted to, I could have put just the words English. That's fine. 
But from an accessibility point of view, if I just set my content this way, um, blind users, users that are disabled might have a difficulty understanding that this copy correlates to this button. To make sure that they can, we're going to use also a label. And with the label, I'm going to want to associate that element with this ID. So I'm going to go ahead and create your label. And I'm going to say it's for, for what? For the EN, that item that has the label EN, and it is in English. And there we go. We've just created our first radio box. Although our copy, our content is CSS3 and not HTML, I'm going to continue on relatively quickly adding a few more items. And I'm just going to go ahead and copy them one by one because I already pre-created them at, while you were away. So I'm adding here also the French French, which we've talked about before. But the difference between this one, and I'm going to make sure that this is also connected to the FRFR. Well, actually, I need to make sure that I put your NID of... Let's set your NID of FRFR. And I'm just going to go ahead there and set it to call it FRFR. Now, notice that this item is also checked, which basically means that it is selected. In HTML5, I could just word the word checked or put any value inside of the value here. Traditionally, most people just write the word checked, checked twice. And if it's uh, uh, enabled, enabled twice or disabled, disabled twice, the three common controllers to selectors now checked basically will make sure that this item is selected so we added english we just added french french let's go ahead and add another one now that let's add the canadian french so i'm going to go ahead here and just add one more item which will be the canadian french and last but not least i want to also add a denmark french which we never created and because we never created it i'm going to go ahead and also make sure that it is disabled but I'm going to go ahead also and make sure that this language code for our FRCA will also correlate. So I'm going to go ahead and create your NID. I'm going to set that ID to be FRCA. And I'm going to do the exact same thing for our Denmarkian friends, FRDE. I'm just creating an ID as well. And I'm going to go ahead here and add that ID to this item, FRDE. Just make sure that these are unique element, unique IDs that are not replicated in any other area inside of your application. So that's it. There we go. We just added our input boxes, that have, uh, our radio boxes more accurately. And now you'll see that our Denmark French is disabled. But it's not really well defined. Even though you, it's not clickable, the item, it doesn't look like it's not clickable, is it? Because our label did not get disabled automatically as well. What I want to do next is I want to go ahead and start talking about the CSS properties that have been introduced in CSS3. Let's jump right into our styling rules. And in our styling rules, I'm just going to scroll down to the last place where we left things. And this time around, we're talking about CSS3 input selectors. Um, and it's really uh, not exactly the name, but uh, there's a few different names, but it doesn't really matter. Let's start ahead with starting with defining. How about we want to define our checkbox? But really, we don't want to change the na nature of the checkbox. And if you do, make sure to check our references because we added in there a, a tutorial about how to change the styling with CSS of checkboxes. So make sure to check that out. But we're going to use the default checkboxes. And personally, I prefer using the default because it's more standard. We're leaving it to the browser. But then you might have scenarios where you have a really visual page where you just can't do that. In our case, we're not going to change that default. And I'm going to go ahead and I want to check the checked. And this is very, very similar to those pseudo codes that we've seen for links in an earlier state where we had visited and uh, uh, link, active, hover, focus. So very similarly, similarly, we have checked. Now, again, don't forget that now that we set it to check, what I'm basically saying is anything that's checked. If I wanted to be more specific, I would put in all the other rules that we've met earlier to define exactly what I want. In this case, I'm saying basically anything that is checked. Anything that is checked in my case, I want to go ahead and set my font size. I'm going to go ahead and double the font size. Go ahead and save that. Put it in the double normal font size. If I go ahead and refresh, we'll see that now our selected item. Oh, and I'll, I need to make sure that I'm saving it. 
So let me, oh, right, right, right. I almost completely forgot. So I'm do, doubling the font size, but does that really matter? No, because our label is not there. So I'm going to have to take advantage of something we learned not that long ago of adjacent combinator. So I'm going to go ahead and say, hey, by the way, whatever is selected, go ahead and select the label right next to it. And that label right next to it, go ahead and make it size twice bigger. So if I go ahead and click on refresh here, we'll see now Canadian French is larger. And each time I click onto a specific item, it's going to automatically become much larger. And really, in this case, I think just a smaller percentage growth of 20% will probably do the trick. All right, so now that we've seen the checked, I wanna just go ahead and show you also the different selectors for enabled and disabled. Now they work very similarly, so I'm just gonna scan through them really quickly. Enabled, enabled. And I'm gonna do this also for the label because I'm fine with this, with the, the, the styling that exists for our the actual radio box but what i want to do is i want to set the font color i want to set the color actually there's not a font i want to set the color to how about we'll set it to some sort of a gray how about we'll just yeah let's just some sort of a gray let's do it a light gray so i'm going to set here cc 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 six times c so that way i'm mixing all the different colors together evenly very close to that maximum value of FFFF, which would be completely white. So as we get closer to the values up or high, higher, we're going to get a lighter shade of gray when we're matching them all together. Again, if we had here all zero, it would be completely black. But if we're notching them all together in the same capacity, we're going to get a color that is less black injected with more white and more white. All right. Equally balanced between all three items. So I'm going to go ahead here and just save this, and now we'll see that for our enabled buttons, they're going to kind of look disabled now, which is definitely not our intent. So I'm going to go ahead and change this from enabled to disabled, and I'm just going to quickly also create one for enabled, and let's set a different color for enabled. And for enabled, how about we set a dark color, so I'm going to go ahead here and select your uh, really light gray, and go ahead and refresh my item. And that's it. Those are the CSS3 selectors. And you can see this selector is dimmed out. It makes it more obvious that it's different than all the rest. Our item, our font is growing slightly as we click into it. Now, I want to wrap up this, this really lecture by showing you a little bit of CSS, a little bit of JavaScript. We're not going to create the JavaScripts ourselves in this lecture, but I went ahead and created it for you. So please feel free to scan through it. If you know already JavaScript, it would be a fantastic opportunity for you to basically play around with it and see it. And even if not, it's an opportunity for you to look. So I went ahead right now and I just added our jQuery script, which is basically a plugin that enables us to do JavaScript coding more easily. It's a third-party plugin. We have courses on it and on JavaScript. So if you want to learn JavaScript, make sure to check those courses out. And we're going to talk about our our custom script, which I've added in, it's in your source files. Make sure to take a peek at it. And I want to walk through this with you so you understand what's going on here. You don't have to memorize or know exactly what it's doing if you don't know JavaScript. What I'm doing here is I'm, I have here an on ready function, which a function basically triggers whenever the document is ready with the usage of this code in line 14. And in this line, what's happening here is I'm basically saying, uh, looking, this is a CSS rule. A CSS selector rule. I'm basically saying here, any input, which is name is language, whenever it changes, make sure to trigger a function that will change the language. And then I'm sending the value that is inside here in each, each selection button, the value itself, I'm sending on to a function called change language. By the way, I'm also doing the exact same thing whenever the application loads. As soon as it loads, I'm basically checking to see what is the item that is checked. Notice how we're using this new feature that we just learned about. And I'm sending its value to our change language to make sure that we upgrade, update the language. And in this line, we're basically going ahead to all the different we're starting off with a CSS item that has just been changed to the language that is selected. And I'm asking to all body elements that have the language that we selected to become displayed. Same is true for our uh, all items that are not our language.
to be displayed as none. And if I go ahead and save this and go back into my browser and click on refresh, you'll see that now whenever I'm selecting a language, and French French is my default now, and you'll see that only the French French is going to be vis visible here, the Le France. And if I go ahead and I change it to English, we'll see that now we have an error here. So let me just check the Canadian French and the Canadian French is working. French French is working. English is not working, means, meaning that we probably have a coding error. So if I go ahead here, a coding error most probable is here in the name itself. And if we go ahead into our language, you'll see that the English code for English is EN, not ENG. So I'm going to go ahead here and just change that value to EN instead of ENG. At some point, I must have added that in by mistake. And if we go ahead here and just click on refresh, we'll see that now our default is going to work and notice also if you know a little bit of javascript then this is going to be interesting this rule makes sure that if i just comment it out if it was not here and the user would go and just select a different language such as canadian french and then it would go let's say to english and then i would click on refresh notice how it's not going to be in english even though i wanted it to be and that is because the default in our css will automatically show our french version so to avoid that scenario, that's exactly the reason why this extra line in line five was added, forcing to update the language based on whatever the input is selected as soon as our application loads. So that's it about uh, these advanced selectors that are new to CSS3 that are widely available on most browsers, most brow modern browsers at this stage. Um, they're incredibly useful and as long as you're building it with some sort of backup capability or with you, when you're working in plugin languages such as um, jQuery and you're using with these features, then jQuery could then figure out a background solution to try to figure out if that is not in, in natively supported. So all these rules that we're learning here about selectors are automatically automatically useful and very, very powerful when you're working also with programming languages like jQuery, where in jQuery, the rule that you put inside here is basically the CSS selector. And we've learned a lot of CSS selectors. So if you know a little bit of JavaScript or played around a little bit with jQuery, it's time for you to go on and grab your jQuery and start playing around with it using selectors. You're going to see you could do amazing things just with the stuff we learned so far. This chapter is not over, but we're definitely getting close to that. We're continuing to look into CSS selectors, and we're done with these CSS3 selectors. So we'll see you in the next lecture as we continue our journey to discover all the various CSS selectors. Over the last few lectures, we met a lot of different types of selectors, and we're moving on to a completely different type of selector group in this lecture. And in this one, we're actually going to talk about selectors that enable you to inject content into your HTML page. And yes, you heard me right. With the help of CSS, you can actually add content dynamically into your pages. This can become very, very useful if you have a digital book and want to add chapters or paragraphs or things that repeat themselves throughout. For example, if you're a news agency and you want to just inject in the middle of the article a text that would say, don't forget to register to our website, or a text that would repeat over throughout your website without cluttering your actual content making it easy for you then down the line to go to that content and change it because it is in many ways a visual content it's not really part of the document it's more of a decoration that is added into the content so by the end of this lecture you're going to know how to add content before and after different elements this was also covered if you followed us in our absolute css course where we actually covered how to create a book titling with numeric system, which was not going to be covered in this lecture. In this one, we're going to take a different approach and learn a different thing. So if you haven't happened to have taken our CSS, absolute CSS course, make sure to check that one out also before or after this lecture. So let's jump right into it. The next group of selectors we're going to take a look at are selectors that enable us to add content into our HTML page. Now, if you took our HTML or CSS course our absolute css course then you already discovered the before and after selectors they're very different than most other selectors that are out there but we're going to spend a little bit of time with it even if you've seen it already before will be a little bit of rehearsal and for our students that just joined us into our css3 course it will be a really great addition because it's a very fabulous element now i'm going to go ahead and create a very complicated example because it's already one that we've met before now, in a previous course. Now, I want to go ahead and first define 
what are we trying to select? And what I really want to do, if I go back to my HTML, I want to make sure that every language that is listed will have the word new before it, except for the ones that is dis that are disabled and have everything that is disabled right after it say coming soon. So I'm going to go ahead and, and build that. It is quite impressive. So I'm going to start off by defining that I want it only to happen to an input item. And I only want it to happen to input items that have a name of language. All right, so we're already weeding out the levels. And I only want items that are enabled. And again, because we don't want to change the actual checkbox itself, or the radio box in this case, we want to go ahead and ask for that uh, next to brother, the item that is right next to it, and I'm going to ask for the label right next to it. Not only do I want the label, I want to go ahead and say, by the way, label, and I'm going to put here two colons, and then the word before. And that will enable me to basically say, hey, I want to go to the label, and before that label, just before, or right in the beginning of that la label, I want to go ahead and add here some content. And this content needs to be just plain text. And in this case, I'm going to write here, new and I'm going to put your space. And if I save this and go back into my application, we'll see that now every single item will have the word new right before it. Very powerful, very advanced. So I'm going to go ahead here and just duplicate this item because I want to basically create the exact same thing. But I'm going to go ahead and do it for our disabled items. <coughs> Excuse me. And instead of sending it to be before again, double colon, and I'm going to set after. Now, if you check out our um, absolute CSS in our absolute CSS course, we actually go through and show you how to create counters directly dynamically in CSS. So it's definitely worth checking out because that's been available for quite a while and something that is very, very sweet and is not going to be covered in this uh, group of lectures as we're very focused on things that are incredibly CSS3 related, besides selectors, which are so important that we felt we were going to go through every single selector, making sure that you have a really rounded look at selectors. So I'm going to go ahead here, and for our content, I'm just going to set here, coming soon. Soon, now well, how about soon? Soon will be added. Ah, that's way better. And if I go ahead here and click on refresh, we'll see a really long soon will be added right inside of our element here that is disabled. And by the way, that gray is just so horrid. I'm going to go ahead and just set it to be a much darker gray or even set it to be uh, almost black. So I'm going to go ahead here and just set here one, 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 one. Save that. Click on refresh because it's just just illegible at this stage. Oh, let me. Oh, that was for enabled. So for disabled, I'm going to go ahead and um, uh, it has to be gray, but it's just that gray just doesn't work because we're, we're working with a blue monitor. So I'm going to go ahead here and just select the color here and just select here something that is dark, but um, not as dark as our other copy. So it'll make it easier to see that it's basically not really selected. I'm going to go ahead here and hopefully this color will be a little bit easier to read. Probably not. Oh, yeah, yeah here we go. I put here too many ampersands. And there we go. All right, that works for me. Not as legible still, but it, at least it doesn't look uh, harsh and, and bad. So there we go. Those were our before and after content adding selectors. And we'll see you in the next lecture. We're still running through selectors. There's many more to come. In the last lecture, we met CSS selectors that enabled us to inject content into our page. And really, we're, we're approaching a new type of selectors. And in this selector, we're going to go back in the go back in time really because we're going back to CSS1 selectors and the selectors we're going to meet in this lecture are selectors that enable us to actually modify the content within that already exists and by then this lecture you will know how to change the layout of the first character or the first line inside of a element. Now this become really really useful again in books if you want to for example create where the first character is much larger and the content is flowing right next to that content which is exactly what we're going to do in this lecture. So let's jump right into it. We're about to talk now about selectors that have been around since CSS1. So this is not as exciting although I, I really love it and you don't see it as often on the web and I don't know why.
So I'm going to go ahead and just jump right into it. They're th from the same type of rules that we met in our last session. They're content driven. And as such, they're changing the content and their structure is a little bit different than regular items. Now, I'm going to start off by saying, what do I want? I want to go to every paragraph and I'm going to put that double colon like we had with the before and after. And now I'm going to say first line. Now, what that, that's going to do is going to help me control the first line of my paragraph. So, for example, if I wanted to, I could have set my font size to be, how about we set it to be 50% um, larger than its current size. So, I'm going to go ahead there and save that. It's default size, it's current configuration. I'm going to double up its size. And if I go ahead and refresh my browser, we'll see now every single paragraph in our application, its first line is going to be doubled in size. I want to continue and also showcase the next item. They're both very simple, so I'm not going to talk about them for too long. I'm going to go ahead and just copy this paragraph first line. And instead of setting it to be first line, I'm going to go ahead and set it to be first letter. Again, CSS1, quite amazing that this existed in CSS1. And for the first letter, I'm just going to go ahead and make it really large. I'm also going to set it to float. Because if I don't, if I just set that first letter to be large, let me just show that. If I just set that item to be larger, then we'll have a really large first character and our copy would continue flowing naturally. But what I really want to happen is for this item to float so the content will scroll around it. To make that happen, I'm going to go ahead into my code here and let, let me make it just uh, four. That seemed way too big. And I'll set my item to float to the left. I'm going to also give it a margin just to make sure that it's nice and pretty. I'll set there 15 pixels. I'm going to go ahead and click on refresh and notice how I use here uh, absolute positioning of 15 pixels. That might be wrong of me. I might, uh, it might be smarter of me if I wanted to keep my application very dynamic is to literally set it based in the EMs as well. So as how about I start with one, e, dot one EM, if I go ahead and refresh that, if I'm happy with the results of that, then I could keep that. Just bear in mind that if I take this one EM and I put it after I resize my font, notice the difference or lack of difference. Let's see. Once I set it after notice that the item is, is rendered this the same way, but it is very hard to know. So what is it? What is 0 0.1 of the original size? Is it 0 0.1 of the new size? The best way to de define that is just put the value of 1 there. And if we put the value of 1 there and if we see the spacing just more or less natural, then we know we're fine. But in this case, we're seeing that that one that EM is based on that new font size. If I just jump it right up here, even if it's sitting, if the margin is sitting above, that does not change the fact that it's defined based on the actual size of this element. So make sure when you're defining your size here to make sure that you're really using small sizes. And you could go also to really small fractions, and that's completely fine. Finding that right perfect value and ratio to your font size that you're using if you don't want too much spacing. But in my case, that, that would probably be too much, so I'll go ahead here and set it to 1. But also one more thing, you know, in these type of stuff, always you could always grab the element, inspect it, find it, find the spacing, find that margin, and then play around with the value. Is that two good? Is that three good? Is that two? Is that maybe one five? And I'm happy with one five, so then I'll go ahead and just set it to be one five. All right, so that's it about about content selectors in general, where in the last lecture, we saw the before and after content adding selectors which were new to CSS2. And in this lecture, we've seen the CSS1 inner content selectors that enabled us to add, manipulate our content in our first line or our first letter of our paragraph. So that's it. We're done with this lecture. We're not done with selectors. So we'll see you in the next lecture as we continue exploring CSS selectors. If you put a gun to my head and asked me what is my favorite CSS selector, my answer would be the target no pun intended. Oh wow, I didn't even re realize that I was just a target, you know, with that virtual gun and all that stuff. Anyways, in this lecture, what we're going to do is we're going to dive a little bit deeper, or not deeper, we're going to be very shallow, as we d explore a really fantastic feature added into CSS3, enabling us to basically talk to specifically a target that is being highlighted. Now, if you're asking yourself, what is a target? The target in the CSS3 terminology is really um, uh, a hashtag area in the page, or basically uh, 
area that the user has just been sent to. In, your, in HTML, you'll find those, you're in a URL, a hashtag, and then an ID, which would then jump the user to a specific area in the page. We're gonna see it all in action in this lecture, and by the end of it, you're gonna have a really, really cool feature that many people don't even know exists, and is one of my favorites. So let's jump right into it. To showcase the next feature, I created a list with a few of our chapters with anchor links that will take us to different sections in our site where there's actual content that correlates to it. I want to show you that in HTML for a second. So if we jump over into our HTML, we'll see that we have your list, an unordered list, and each item has a link that has a hashtag and an ID connecting to a section in the page. So if we scroll all the way to the bottom, we'll find a few sections here. For example, the uni one, which was the first one that correlates to it. Thus, when the user clicks on and the URL changes to the hashtag UNI, it will jump to that section in our page. Beautiful. And now it's time for us to showcase this amazing feature that is available um, as a selector since CSS3. And it is a pseudo class, which basically a pseudo class, which basically just means that it is not a hands on class, but a generated class that is being created. Now, basically, it's, it's, it's called the target selector, or at least I'm calling it the target selector because it seems the most appropriate name. And the way it works is incredibly simple and incredibly beautiful. You write the word target. And that will make sure that it's going to focus on the item that is currently being focused in the URL. So if I click on to the hashtag into uni, then this uni element, this section, if I highlight the section, this is what the target means because this is the target currently in our scope, making it very easy for us to highlight the section that the user just clicked on. For example, I'm going to set the background color to be yellow. If I go ahead and save this, click on refresh, we'll see that now that our target is selected, if I click on refresh, that target is now going to be highlighted. Not only that, dynamically, as we click on to different areas, so if I go to, let's say, the linking and actions, we'll see that now the linking and actions will be selected and it dynamically will change those selections. Incredibly powerful, incredibly cool. What I want to do next before we wrap up this lecture is I really want to also maybe dim out all the sections that are not the target. There currently isn't, as we make this video, a way to say, hey, everything that is not the target because it could be really anything. But in our case, we know that we only have sections that relate to our targets. So I could go ahead and just add here a section. And I'm going to say not leveraging that capability of saying we don't want and hey, I don't want a target. And what's not target, I could go ahead here and set a background to all of them if I wanted to. But in this case, I want to go to all my H2s, set their font size to be uh, maybe one and a half EM. And I'm going to go ahead and also set the color of the font of the font itself to be gray. And let me go ahead and duplicate this because I really want to change the paragraphs as well. So I'm going to go ahead here into our paragraph. And for our paragraph, same deal applied. I'm just going to set it to its size of dot eight, let's say. And I'm going to set it to color gray as well. Let's keep it at that. Oh, that's not that's not P. There you go. And that's it. That's all we have to do to make sure that the item itself will be selected and everything that is not that item will be dimmed out, making it very easy for us to then jump to certain sections, highlighting those sections and making the items that are not basically fade away. Amazing stuff really cool brand new to css3 selectors we're almost done we still have a few more things to cover in css selectors so i'm going to see you right so really soon in the next lecture we are nearing the end of this course and really uh, the, the, the this lecture group on selectors and the next two lectures are going to be all about structural selectors now structural selectors enable us to basically control things that have some sort of structural behavior, such as asking for the first item or last item in a group of items. So we're really talking about the structure of that HTML tree of the node. So if an if a element has 10 elements inside of it, what if we wanted to highlight every second item or every third item in that node? So we're going to learn a lot of those in this lecture, we're covering one CSS2 structural element and a lot of CSS3 ones. And in the next lecture, we're going to continue on working on those type of structural elements. So let's jump right into them. Let's jump into structural elements.
We are nearing the end of this group of lectures on CSS3 selectors. Now, uh, the next group of topics which will be included in this lecture and the next one is all about structural selectors. So let's take a let's take a gander at it. Let's right away start ahead. And I'm just going to go ahead and just put our headline here so you could easily find it. And we're going to start off talking about CSS2 structural pseudo class selectors. That was a big full mouth of a lot. But really there's only one of them and really in CSS2, that's where the door was opened to all these new st structural selectors that we're going to be discovering in this lecture and the next one. Now, what I want to do is I basically want to make sure that my first item here has basically a dash in the beginning, basically to bound our um, whole, all of our elements really in many ways. I really, I really want to create a box around this so this this whole list in general, but I don't want to use the 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 regular flow. I just want to hear the uh, I want to have a, a a marker on the top and maybe a marker on the bottom. So let's start with the top, and I'm just going to go ahead and say, hey, I want our list item. But not any list item, I want our, our first child. And by setting it to be our first child, I could literally just go ahead there and put whatever rule I want. So in this case, I want to do a border top. And I'm just going to go ahead and set it to be two points. I'm going to make it dashed. And I'm going to set a color to be, uh, let's set it to be black. Save it. Let's go ahead and click on refresh. And now we should see that we have your a dash bounding our first selector, making it very easy for us if we want to do something specific to a specific item. For example, if you have the different paragraphs and you want to have a different treatment to the first paragraph or the first of any type inside of a group, then there'll be a perfect answer, your first child of a certain section. So once you get into a section, you could get its child. Now, but by the way, for example, if you had a plethora of different items and you didn't want to list it out as a list item because it's not a list item, you might have just gone to your UL and say, okay, I just want the first item or first child inside there. And if I've done that and clicked on refresh, we would see that the first child would still be each this time around, which would be each item because each item is the first child of that element. Con on contraire, if I set it to be the UL and I set it up and I refreshed it, notice what would happen. It wouldn't work at all because the first child here would be the whole document because our UL is configured and sitting inside of the full document. So this is not the first child and it's somewhere in the body. So it's really not getting us anywhere. Thus, when we're setting us our first child of the LI, we're literally saying the first child where our LI is at one of the children. Because notice when we don't have a space, we're basically talking directly to that level. So we're asking the LIs and that level of LIs for the first child. So basically in, 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 in plain language, what we're basically saying is, okay, there's an LI right here and I want to get now the first child. So really we're, we're talking to all the LIs asking for the first child. And by coincidence, we're really talking to LI as an LI as well. So let's continue. Now that we're done with the CSS2 structural codes, it's time for us to move on to the structural codes of CSS3, and there's plenty of them. And we could let's start off with the most simple one. So I'm just going to copy here our first child, because really what we want to do is to do the exact opposite, the last child. So I'm going to go ahead and set it to be last child. And this time around, we're going to set it to the bottom. And instead of making a dash, how about we make it solid? And if I go ahead and save this, we'll see that now we have also a dash on the last item in our selectors as well. But that's nice. This is all could have been done maybe with tables if we went into that extent. Obviously, some things we couldn't, like if we wanted to make this in a different background color or maybe larger or smaller or so forth. But let's take it a step further. What if you wanted to have a different background per child. So what if every second or every third child or every whatever you would want to have a different color or a different configuration to it. Lucky for us again, incredibly easy. All we have to do is set an LI again and then ask for the nth child, which it basically means and and I'm going to put here a value such as the second every second item or every third item. And just by setting that I could go ahead and I'm just going to copy a background color that I pre-configured earlier. I could basically say hey, every third item every third item inside of this parent inside of this element mark its color to be the color that we're identifying right here now notice if i click here on refresh if i click here on refresh if i save it and then i click on refresh 
Oh, you know what? It's the color is so light that it's almost invisible. So you can see that this item is selected. This item is selected. If I go ahead and just comment out that background, you'll you'll notice a slight change. If you take if you notice, there is a break. So that break was undone. So my mistake. I, I used the wrong color for this one. But let's continue anyways because I want to showcase the different capabilities. So I'm going to go ahead and continue with another color, but this time I'm going to add my 3N and say plus 1, which will basically be an odd one step further. And in this case, I'm going to set a color as well, but it's going to be a much better, better color, one that we'll probably notice. And if I go ahead and click on refresh, now we'll have here a stepping stone, and now we have a stepping stone. All that's left for us to do is also color code our third item. So I'm going to go ahead and color code our third item as well. Notice how I could put here the steps with the three and two and whatever amount of steps I want it to be to create that nth ruling. Or I could just go ahead and set an absolute value such as one, two, three, if that was something that I needed. All right, I'm going to go ahead and save that and just click on refresh once I change the color. So I'm going to set here another shade of blue. And I'm going to go ahead and save that, click on refresh, and now we can see that every single step has been blocked by our regular element with these beautiful elements. Now, I want to talk about a few more things before we wrap up this lecture. And really what I want to talk about is I want to talk about, we've already seen it more or less, but I want to take it one step further. So we said we could take the nth child. And we said with our nth child, I'm just going to go ahead and copy this. We could go ahead and say, hey, I want the second child by putting directly the second child. And I'm gonna go ahead here and set here a color that is very different. I'm gonna set it to be, uh, I'm gonna set it to be white. A type of, a shade of white really in many ways. And if I click on refresh, we'll see that in the shade of white, we can see our item is selected. Our second item is selected. Now, I, I wanna take it one step further. And, and I want to talk about uh, a few more things, and, and, and among them is really the, the capability of us to define a type, and when would you actually want to do that. So to be able to do that, I'm going to go to my UL here, and I'm going to add more children that are not of LI type, just to showcase the problem. So I'm going to go ahead here and just set here an H2 as the first thing here. And I'm going to put another one right here for our links of our site. So we'll have your check our links and we'll have here also the descriptions of our lectures all sitting in one place. But I want you to notice something. Our second item that was supposed to be uh, white, notice what is going to be marked white now. The first item. The reason is, is because it is the second item inside of our UL. As you as you remember, if you remember we talked about it, we said that the LI, the way it works, an nth child is not dependent on the LI. The LI is just a reference and we're asking for the parent for the children. So in many so basically when I'm asking for the second item, I'm asking for the second item that is actually inside of that UL. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to show you the way to define it in a way that would work. And for that we're going to use the of type. Nth of type. And the nth of type will say, uh, from the type of li, the second item, enabling us to then go ahead and mark the second item. And again, any item, any CSS rule that starts with nth, all these n the numeric systems that we worked with so far will work on them as well. Now, I just want to show you one more item, and I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to comma this, and I want to show... Uh, one more thing. So we we've seen also the uh, if I'll do the li, I could do also nth last child say i wanted the second from last to be and if i go ahead and i click on refresh here this is all good still it is the second from last but if i went ahead and i said hey i wanted third from last right if i said it to be the third from last then again i'm gonna have a problem because it's now not gonna select my li because it is, there is no third item that is selected so for me to be able to say hey i want it to be from there is no third item, so basically this rule of the third from last just never gets applied. For me to be able to apply it, what I'm going to have to do is ask for the nth last of type. Nth last of type. And by setting the nth last last of type, I could then go ahead and say, okay, ignore anything that is not of that, and then we're going to highlight those elements. So that's it really, and I'm just going to go ahead here and I'm going to paste inside all the items, just walk through them really quickly. So how about we put it right in the beginning here, um, before the two and three selectors, I'm just going to paste it right here. So we met the first child, it was literally the first child. We met the last child right after that, 
and the last child enable us to select the last item in a group without re relevance to the actual um, what item it is. But if the last item was not that item, then just nothing would happen because that rule would not be applied. We've then seen the nth child and the nth last child, and again, with the same type of structural logic that was behind it that defined us based on whatever rule we put inside of our element. Last but not least, well, not last but not least, we saw the type elements enabling us to choose from the nth type of, making sure that we're only selecting the items based on their type, ignoring the numeric system of things that are not of that type. And thus, we've seen it in the uh, for the the regular flow or the last basically going backwards instead of going forwards so they're basically the two of these are comparable to the two of these so that's it for these core structural pseudo classes but we're not done with pseudo classes we're going to continue looking at a few more pseudo classes that are only available in cs3 in the next lecture so i hope to see you then that's it. This course, this lecture, this chapter, this essence of CSS3 selectors is over. We're, there's a few more properties we're going to cover in this lecture following up and finishing our conversation about structural CSS selectors. We're going to meet uh, the basically everything that's left in CSS selectors in this lecture. So how about we jump right into it. Thank you so much for taking this course, uh, taking this chapter. Once you're done with it, make sure to follow up and continue in our further chapters are further episodes of CSS3 so you become a really really super CSS3 developer. When we're continuing working on CSS selectors really focused on structural CSS selectors and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm not gonna go and do each and every one of them we've seen quite a lot of them already I'm gonna go through just talking briefly about some of the ones that we didn't cover yet and they're very intuitive, so we won't really need to. So I'm going to go ahead and just paste a few of those as we speak about them. The first of type and the last of type is very similar to the first child and last child, only it's of a specific type. So if I want to get the first of that specific type, then I, would, I could say that, or the last of that type, which, by the way, it correlates to that nth of type, putting one here, or nth last of type with the value one. So those are basically the same. All right, so let's continue onwards. The next one that I want us to look at is the only child. And I'm not gonna actually do it because um, just to save us some time, the only child is basically is the same thing as if we would set first child, last child. Or in other words, if an element has only one child. Now we're gonna see it in action in a second because really this one is the more different than maybe the more complex one. But I wanna just walk through all the different elements first. And I wanna talk also about another one that is very similar that is called only of type. The only of type works very similarly, only this one is first of type, last of type. So it's a little bit different and we're gonna look at the differences in a second once we go to the live presentation. Last but not least, there's two more structural elements that we haven't touched at all because we don't really have a usage for them in, in our day-to-day -day uses, where the empty one would return to us any HTML element of the specific type that we're asking for or of any other type that doesn't have any content, including any text. This could be very useful in, in JavaScript when you want to get rid of paragraphs that no content is within them. The root tab, so we're not going to see it in action, but it will return to you an empty element of whatever element type that you choose to bring back. The root will return us always our root itself of our document. In HTML, that would be our HTML document itself. Not something that we really have a use for in our case, but I encourage you, if you do know how to use it or if you're up to a challenge, try to search up and find out a useful scenario where you would use the empty or root selectors and make sure to add that into our commenting section. So with that, with that, that, with that overview done, I want to talk now more specifically live about the only child and only of type. To do that, I'm going to go ahead and add one more attribute into our list of attributes of our structural selector attributes, really. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to say, I want a span tag and I want the only, when it's the only child, which basically means is whenever, whenever I have a span tag that has no brethren's so let, what we want to do in that scenario, I'm going to go ahead and set a background color and I'm going to set that to be yellow and I'm going to go ahead and set the color of the font to be red. 
Now notice that we do have two rules here that would it would work for two. One of them is going to be our item right here, which originally had we had marked, and the second one will be inside of our HTML inside of our footer. So let's take a deeper look into that. In our in our section in our article, if we find it up above, we'll see that the span is inside of a B tag, and really it's true. It's the only child of that B tag. Same is true for our element inside of our footer where we have our span right here, which is the only child of the span that is outside of it. Now, let's take a look at the difference between that only child and only of type. If I change my from only child to only of type, it's going to do it a little bit differently, and I want you to pay attention here. So if I go, go ahead and click on refresh, we'll see that first of all, for our item in the top, it's the exact same thing. But for the item below, we're marking the whole span. And you might ask yourself, why is that? And the answer is very simple. Although this rule still applies, this is, this is getting selected and it would be highlighted, this item is getting selected as well. The reason is, is because it's the only span inside of this div. And because there's only one span inside of this div, then the span is selected. And that is the reason why this whole span is selected. So the difference between the two of the only of type ignores if there's other things counting that one if that's there's one of that type inside of that specific uh, parent. Contrary to that, the only child really reflects if there's only one item explicitly inside of the HTML inside of that bounding parent. So that's it. We're done with our CSS structural selectors. And with it, we're done with the whole conversation of CSS selectors. And we're done with this whole conversation. So I hope you enjoyed this group of lectures on CSS three selectors. And I hope to see your comments below on actionable items that you're doing with these new CSS selector rules that you're working with. So we'll see you in our next chapter or next course. So thanks for watching. Zero to geek. Learning better is better.